Welcome, you chosen few. It's uh, good to be together to worship the Lord. This morning, uh, we're, we're thankful that, that we can continue to meet together and uh, also welcome those of you who are worshiping online this morning. Uh, today is the third Sunday of Advent. Uh, it's the third Sunday of Advent as we continue into this Advent season. Advent, of course, is a time of hope, a time when we Consider the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the coming of, of our Savior to this earth, here to redeem a people to himself. And uh, that's what we've come to celebrate. That's, that's what we're celebrating all month long this, this Christmas season. Uh, just before we uh, go into worship, as far as announcements are concerned, there, there isn't much. Uh, at, at this point, the, there's, uh, there's, there's not any real in-person things happening at the church at this point. Uh, we're going to continue to, to keep on the current uh, track with meeting Sunday mornings as, as we have been, uh, but other, other events are not going to be happening in the church. Uh, some things will be happening online. I know the Women's Bible Study is, is meeting online. Um, you can call the office if you have any questions about that. One thing I do have to announce, we are going to be having a Christmas Eve service, and uh, tentatively our, our plan is to do that outside. Uh, we're going to do a, a Christmas Eve service, 6 p.m. Christmas Eve. It, it'll be fairly short, uh, you know, and uh, weather, weather permitting, we're going to plan to be outside. So come for a time of singing some Christmas, Christmas carols together. We'll have a, a short devotional from God's Word, and we'll have a, a candle lighting as well. So uh, if the weather changes, we may end up coming inside, but uh, just stay tuned. We'll let you know through our our one call system uh, with that. So, so that's the plan for now. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, we're going to continue now into worship. We're going to uh, have our, our Advent reading for today. Today, the third Sunday, is uh, when, we, when we think about the joy of the coming of our Lord. So that's, that's the theme for uh, this Sunday's Advent ca candle. The floor. Reading this morning from Isaiah 35, 1 and 2, verse 4 and 5, and verse 10. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and bloom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. And the ransom to the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Father in heaven, we come to you with joy, uh, not because our circumstances are, are the way that we want them to be, not 
not because everything is right in the world, not, not because we necessarily even feel happy. Lord, we know that, that joy doesn't depend on any of those things. We know that joy comes from having a right relationship with you. Joy comes from knowing you, having, having our, our foundation in you, and knowing that, that you have come to save the world, and you will come and set all things right in the end. Father, that is our joy this morning, and, and, and we, we've come to worship you and, and praise you because of that. Oh Lord, we ask that as we come in this morning to worship you, we pray that you would be at work in our hearts. We pray that, that your word would have its way in us, that, that our minds would be changed, that, that we would uh, be brought to a place of repentance over the sin that still remains in us. And Father, we ask that you would be glorified and lifted up in everything that we say and do this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand and uh, we'll sing Hark the Herald Angels Sing. of confession this morning comes from Isaiah 55. That's what the Lord says. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and our God for he will abundantly pardon. Let's go to the Lord in prayer to confess our sins. I'll start and then we can have some time of silent confession. Lord, we're here this morning to seek you. Lord, we seek to draw near to you and we thank, that, thank you, Lord, that um, 
you're not a God that is aloof or that, that runs or hides from us, but you want that from us, Lord. You want us to be near to you, um, and that's why you have us confess, Lord. Lord, we confess the way we've forsaken you, the unrighteous things that we've thought and said and done this week, Lord. Um, we confess those, Lord. Lord, we desire to return to you. We just thank you for your compassion, Lord, um, and that you abundantly pardon us, Lord, that you don't withhold, um, but that you seek to do that as many times as, as we need, Lord, um, above and beyond, certainly what we deserve. Lord, hear our silent confessions now. Verse of assurance comes from Psalm 103. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. I you now to take your hymn book and uh, turn to page 170. We're going to sing once again, and uh, please stand. to join with me in professing our, our faith together, proclaiming together what we believe, and we use the, the historic creeds and confessions of the church to do that. This morning we're looking at Westminster Shorter Catechism, question number 21. Who is the Redeemer of God's elect? The only Redeemer of God's elect 
is the Lord Jesus Christ, who being the eternal Son of God, became man, and so was and continueth to be God and man in two distinct natures, in one person forever. And let's take some time now to go to our Lord and bring all of our prayers, all of our requests to him. Father, you are the great one. You are, you are the one who created us. You are the one who had us on your mind. Before time began, Lord, you, you knew us. You extended your love to us with an unfailing, powerful love. Oh, Father, in, in your wisdom and, and your might and your power, you created the world in, in the space of, of seven days. And, and at the end, you said it was good. And when you looked at, at man and, and the woman that you created, you said, it is very good. Father, we're so thankful that, that you are the one who's created us. You are the one who has a plan for us. You are the one who has a plan for all of your creation. And Father, there is, there is no moment of time. There is, no, uh, there is no space. There is no place in the world that is, that is not a part of that plan that you have. Your good, loving, and perfect plan. And so, Father, we have, we have great hope in that. We have great peace in that. And, Father, we have joy because we know that, that even though we, in, in our sin, because of the sin that, that we inherited from, from Adam, but also because of, of our own sin that we've added on to, on, on to that, Lord, we know that we had transgressed against you. We know that we had broken covenant with you. But, Father, you had always planned, even from the beginning, to send your Son to redeem us. And, Father, that is, that's why we celebrate these weeks, this time of the year. That's, we, we celebrate the coming of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, because we know that he is the one who has set us free. We know that he is the one who gives us a lasting hope, a lasting peace, and a lasting joy. So, Father, we worship him today. He's the one that we stand secure on. He's the one that we stand firm on. Even, even though we look around in this world and so much seems to be spinning out of our control, we know that it is out of our control. But it's not out of your control. And so we're thankful for that. Father, I pray that even as we walk through these challenging days, Lord, I pray that, that you would help your people to do the things that you've called them to do. Father, I pray that we would, that we would be a people who are desiring to obey your word and your, your law. Father, help us to, to follow the great commandments, to love you with our whole heart, whole soul, mind, and strength, and, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Father, give us wisdom on how to do that in these difficult days. Father, we pray that, that you would help us as your followers, to be about the things that you've called us to be about. Father, help us to, to seek to, to develop that, that fruit of the Spirit, that we know the Spirit is working in us. Father, we pray that you would help us to spend more time focusing on, on how to become more, more loving, peaceful, gentle, uh, patient people in this world. Father, help us to develop those, those qualities. Help us to be focused on those things. Father, when we, when we look around, when we spend our time looking, looking more at the sin outside of us, there is there's so much to see. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things that, that really discourage us right now. Father, we are, we are uh, discouraged by the way we see people treating each other. We're discouraged by the, uh, the divisions in this country. Father, we're, we're discouraged by what, what appears to us as uh, a total ignorance of the truth in, in many places. Father, we're discouraged that, uh, that so many people can't, can't discuss things in a, in a charitable, gracious way. Father, we're discouraged to see families that, that are struggling and breaking apart. Father, we're, we're discouraged by what we see uh, in, in, our, in our government in, in, in many places. Father, we pray that in the midst of all these discouragements that, that we would recognize that our hope is never in those things to begin with. 
that that's not where peace comes, that's not where joy comes. And Father, help us not to be surprised when we see sin in the world. Father, help us to be fixed on you. Father, help us to keep, to keep seeking after you, to, to become the people that you want us to be. Help us to be agents of love and mercy and grace in this world. Oh, Father, I, I'm, I get so discouraged when I hear reports of, of, of even people who, who call themselves Christians and call on your name when they're, when they're calling for violence uh, or, or calling for um, things that, that are opposed to you. Oh, Father, we pray that, that your church would rise up and would, would become agents of mercy and grace, that, that the gospel would shine forth more than, more than anything else from, from your people. Lord, we pray for those today who are struggling with the, the coronavirus. Father, we pray for those we know that our, our hospitals are, uh, are full. We know that uh, this country has, is uh, struggling more today than, uh, than any other day. We, we've heard the news of the death tolls that uh, every day are, are very um, discouraging to us. And so, Father, we, we want to pray for those who are sick now. We pray for those who are uh, health care providers right now as they continue to endure and are just exhausted. Um, oh, Father, we ask for your mercy on them. Lord, we pray once again that, that you would guide us. We ask, Father, that as we look at your word today, that, that your word would do its work, that your spirit would be at work among us. Father, we pray that you would help us uh, to, to lay aside any um, pre-existing ideas that we have that, that are not in conformity with your word. Father, please shape us. Please mold us. Please change us into what you want us to be. And we ask that you would do all these things in the mighty name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you for sharing that with us, Brittany. Well, it's good to be back together again this morning. Um, I heard that that your time the last couple of weeks with, with Rob and with Flavian were, were good, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. My family, uh, we had a very restful vacation, and uh, we're, we're back now, ready for the Advent season, though the rest of us are quarantining today since we were with uh, some family from Pennsylvania. But uh, we're... Right now, for the next few weeks as we go into the Christmas season, we're going to take a break from Luke. I know we've been, we've been doing Luke for over a year now. Uh, you might remember we, we started last year, last Christmas season, we started the book of Luke. So it's, it's been a year uh, that we've been in Luke. And as good as that is, we're going to take a few weeks uh, of a break from that. And we're going to take a look at some passages that tell us about the incarnation of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and that's what we celebrate this time of year, the, the incarnation. Uh, the word of incarnate, of course, means that Jesus, the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, uh, became flesh. He took on human physical flesh, just like what you and I have. Um, you know, I used to tell students back when I was a youth pastor that uh, when, whenever you think of the word incarnate, think of the, the Spanish word carne, which of course means meat. Uh, in a sense, Jesus is, he's, he's in the meat, he's in the flesh, he's, he, he came, he took on a physical body with all of its aches and its pains, all of, all of its limitations, all of its comforts uh, in every way, just like your body or my, or my body. But who, who was this man? Who was this man? The Bible has a lot to say about who Jesus was. Uh, he, he existed in all of eternity past, before he came to earth, uh, in, in spirit. But he was willing to come and be clothed in human flesh. So that's what we're going to take a look at the, these last couple of weeks. A, a deeper look at who Jesus is and some passages that, that talk about Jesus' coming. Uh, this week we're going to take a look at Isaiah 11, 1 through 10. Uh, as we read through this passage, you might, you might recognize some of it. Uh, but, but I also want us to understand that the context of this passage. Uh, so be before we read it, I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit. It was, it was written at a time, uh, it, it was written by the prophet Isaiah to the people of Judah. Now, this was written at a time when, when the kings of Judah were becoming uh, more and more unfaithful to the Lord. Uh, yes, they, they were descendants uh, of David and Solomon, the, the line of kings. But, but by the time that Isaiah had written this, the current king, King Ahaz, had lost all hope in trusting the Lord. Uh, other nations had been attacking Judah uh, and instead of trusting the Lord, King Ahaz put his hope in foreign kings. Uh, he put his, his hope in, in the military might of Assyria, hoping that Assyria would, would help out. Uh, king Ahaz, did, he, he didn't look very much like King David or King Solomon, the, the great kings of old. Um, and the people of Judah were becoming worried. They remembered the, the covenant that God had given David, the, the, the covenant promise that there would be a king from the line of David on the throne forever. But, but these, these kings that they had had recently, uh, they were not very inspiring. They weren't giving very much hope to the people. So, so on that note, recognizing that context, I, I, I want to invite you now to join with me in standing, uh, and, and we'll read the word of the Lord from Isaiah 11. This is Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 10, reading from the English Standard Version. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. 
and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for all the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Join me in prayer. Father, these are hopeful words. These are encouraging words. Lord, you know the state of the world in which we are in today. You know the idols that have captured the attention of, of the world and, and many around us, even, even in our own hearts. Father, we pray that you would help us this morning to, to look at these words and that even in difficult times, we would, we would find the hope, the joy, and the peace that, that your word offers. Father, show us the righteous branch this morning. Show us Jesus. Lord, make us agents of, of hope and salvation in this world that is full of division, death, and despair. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please be seated? So our outline, as you can see in the bulletin there today, if you have it, uh, there's, there's three main points. They're, they're from three objects in this passage. Uh, number one is the stump, number two is the branch, and number three is a signal. A stump, a branch, and a signal. So first, we want to take a look at, at the stump of Jesse, and that's in verse one. It says, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. So what is this passage talking about when it talks about the stump of Jesse? Well, as I mentioned before, this prophecy was given to Isaiah during, during the time of uh, Judah's King Ahaz. And King Ahaz was not a king who feared the Lord. If, if you want to read more about him this week, his story's in 2 Kings chapter 16. Ahaz got into a war with the northern kingdom of Israel. This, these are, you, if you remember the history, you know the northern and southern kingdom uh, had split after the time of Solomon. And Ahaz now had gotten into a war with the northern kingdom of Israel. These are even relatives of, of his own people. Um, but instead of seeking the Lord for help or for peace during this war, during this war he turned to the pagan king of Assyria. In his desperation, Ahaz, he, he was even so desperate that he took some of the, the gold and silver out of the temple of the Lord, out of the temple that Solomon built, and he took it and paid off the king of Assyria, hoping that the king of Assyria would, would bring his army and get rid of uh, the attacking army from northern Israel. Uh, at, at one point, Ahaz even went to Damascus, and he met with the king of Assyria. And while he was there, he learned how to worship the Assyrian gods. He decided when he went back that, that he would have the priests uh, in, in Judah build altars to the Assyrian gods. The Lord was not pleased with Ahaz. If you would look at Isaiah chapter 8, you would see where the Lord tells Isaiah that uh, because of King Ahaz's idolatry, Assyria, that, that very nation that Ahaz had, had gone to and paid off for help, eventually Assyria would come and destroy their lands. The Lord says in Isaiah 8.8 8, that Assyria would be like a raging river that floods their land and reaches all the way up to their neck, nearly drowning them all. Assyria did come. It would come during, during the reign of Ahaz's son, King Hezekiah. Now, if, if you remember your history, you might remember that it wasn't Assyria that actually ended the kingdom of Judah. It, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't Assyria. It was, it was Babylon that would eventually do that. But Assyria did come. And, and they did almost destroy the kingdom of Judah had it not been for the Lord's intervention during Hezekiah's time. So the stump of Jesse. What is the stump of Jesse? Well, it's a representation of the royal family. The royal family of Israel and Judah. 
Jesse, of course, you might remember, Jesse was the father of King David, the grandfather of Solomon. Uh, and a stump is a representation of just what had become of the line of David. It was cut off. You know, when a, when a healthy tree is cut off at its trunk, uh, all, all the branches come, come down and the, everything gets chopped up for lumber or for firewood. Uh, all that's left is a stump. And a stump is not really a thing of great beauty or power. Uh, it's, it's not usually something that people want left in their yard. Uh, you, you know, I was extremely grateful a little while back when uh, on our house they started doing the excavating work and, and there, was this, there was this big old stump in, in the backyard. And you know, I had been, some of you are nodding your head, you know, you know that stump. And, and I've been thinking, how am I gonna get rid of this stump? Am I gonna have to uh, try to chop it up or burn it out? And, well, well, thankfully when the excavating crew came in, they just plowed the whole thing over and now it's, it's not even there anymore. So, so I'm glad I don't have to worry about that, that ugly old thing or, or try to figure out how to get rid of it. You, you all know what a stump is like. Uh, it's, it's not really something that you want to have around, necessarily. Um, you also know what a family tree is. You know a family tree is a, vis a, a visual representation of, of your family's history, right? Uh, the, the farther back you go, the, the more branches you, you get and the bigger the, the tree becomes. Uh, this prophecy is saying here that the family tree of the line of, of Jesse David and Solomon would become a stump. It's going to be cut off. The glory, the might, the power that, that Israel had remembered from back in the days of, of David would be no more. But how could that be? Uh, you, you probably remember there was, there was a covenant that God made with David. God made a promise to David. He promised David in 2 Samuel 7, 13, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So how could God allow this line to be cut off? How could he allow it to be a stump? Well, for a time, God would do just that. Even though the Assyrians didn't conquer Judah, eventually the Babylonians did. From the fall of Jerusalem in 586 BC to the, to the time of Christ, there was no king from the line of David on the throne. So, had God abandoned this promise? Had he broken the covenant? Of course, you know the answer is that he didn't. He didn't break the covenant. But his people did. His people did. And you might remember uh, the warnings against breaking the covenant that were, that were in the Old Testament. Uh, many, many years before Isaiah and Ahaz and even before David and Solomon, back just before the death of Moses, God spoke to Moses in Deuteronomy 31. He said, uh, this is just before Moses died. God said to him, behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers. Then this people will rise and whore after foreign gods among them in the land that they are entering. They will forsake me and break my covenant that I have made with them. Then my anger will be kindled against them in that day. And I will forsake them and hide my face from them and they will be devoured. So the family tree of Jesse, that great hope of Israel, was about to become a stump. Judgment was coming for Judah. And it wasn't pretty. Uh, their own northern brothers in the northern kingdom of Israel were at war with them. Their king was seduced by foreign power. Uh, it, he was worshiping foreign gods. Their priests were commanded by the king to lead the people to worship these Assyrian gods. The, the people didn't know who to trust anymore. Other parts of the book of Isaiah also tell us there was, there was great oppression and injustice in the land of Judah. The rich, were not the, the rich were not following the demands of the law of Moses to care for the poor. If you look at Isaiah 5, verses 8 and 9, it says, Woe to those who join house to house, who add field to field until there is no more room, and you are made to dwell alone in the midst of the land. The Lord of hosts has sworn in my hearing, Surely many houses shall be desolate, large and beautiful houses without inhabitant. The stump of Jesse was cut off, and judgment was coming. The people didn't know who to trust, where to turn to, where to find justice, where to find hope. Does that sound anything like our situation today? We're looking for, for voices of authority that we can trust. 
Are we struggling with who to listen to when we want to find the truth? The people of Isaiah's day knew that feeling well. Uh, are, are we concerned about injustice in our land? And if we are, what, what injustices are we concerned about? You know, there's, there's a lot of different ones to choose from. Uh, some of us may be concerned about the oppression of the church. We may be worried uh, about, about loss of religious freedom. Some of us might be worried about other things. We might be worried about what's, what's happening in our, our economy or, or what, what uh, is going on with, with our government. We may be worried that, um, we may be worried for those who have lost jobs recently or those who have had to close down businesses. We might be worried about the deep divisions that are in our country right now. We might be worried about the ideological divide. We might be worried that, that, that the conflict that's just a war of words right now could become something greater than that. Our reality is not so different from the time of Isaiah. But this prophecy in Isaiah 11 is not just a prophecy of judgment. This is actually a prophecy of great hope. So let's, let's look at it again. It's, it's not just about the stump. It's about the, the shoot that comes from the stump, the branch, the righteous branch. So let's, let's take a look at it again. And, and as we look at this passage, there's, there's three characteristics of the branch that I want to look at. And I, I think they're written in your bulletin there. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see, or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. The stump of Jesse looked like it was dead. It looked like it was just going to rot away and that the line of kings would be lost. But even though God's people had broken the covenant, God himself had not. There's, there's one more shoot that's going to come out from that worn out old stump. It, you, you gardeners out there, you, you know what it's like, right? When you, when you trim back all of your hedges or when you, when, you, when you cut down a tree or a plant, you spend a lot of time working in your garden and then, then you come back in a week or, or two weeks and then, and then you see there's, there's this, this one weed or this one plant that you miss and it just, it's suddenly just sprouting out and it's two feet off the ground. You thought you had everything, but now there it is. Well, this shoot is a little bit like that. It looked like the stump was dead, but from the stump of Jesse comes the righteous branch. God always keeps his covenants. There's three things about the branch that I want to see here. First, in verses 2 and 3, we can see the wisdom of the branch. This, this person, this branch from the line of Jesse, he, he will carry with him unsurpassed wisdom. It says the, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him with wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. This branch is going to have a supernatural understanding from the spirit of God himself. He will, he will not act simply with the wisdom of men. He's, he's not just going to act based on what he sees. It says he shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. He's not just going to look at the surface. He, he, will, he will not only see in the ways that men see. He'll have a truth that, that only comes from knowing and fearing the Lord. If you look at verse 3, it says, His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Does that seem like an odd thing to, do, to delight in? You know, when, when uh, one of my kids is afraid of the dark, 
It's not really a delightful thing for them. It's not really something that, that they enjoy. But, but here, in this verse, it says, the branch will delight in a fear of the Lord. You know, I, I think that's because the fear of the Lord is, is the opposite of the fear of men. Fear of the Lord means that God becomes the, the object of your, your greatest respect, your, your greatest worship. He is, he is the one that you want to please in, in spite of what, what everyone else in the world is, is doing or, or what everyone else thinks or says. Fearing the Lord means that God is the one with the most weight, the most gravity in your life. When everything else is, is, is submitting to God's authority, it, it can actually be a delight. That's what Isaiah is saying. You know, um, if you would talk to most child psychologists, or, or even just if, if you're a parent yourself, uh, you, you probably know this already. You, you probably know that the times when a child is most anxious is when a child has no trustworthy authority figure over their life. A child is, is most anxious when they, when they don't have a structure over them or someone that they can trust in authority over them. I know some of us didn't always have loving, loving parents or guardians when we were kids, but, but, but it's well known, it's, it's well documented that, that, that when a child has a, a loving, consistent authority, they flourish. Why is that? Well, you know, a child doesn't have to be afraid of the world when they know they're not the one in control. When they know that they have a loving authority figure, when they have a loving parent over them who's going to care for them and protect them, the fear of the Lord operates in the same way. When, when, when our greatest authority is the Lord himself and when our respect for the Lord is, is the thing that, that is above all else, we don't have to fear the world in the same way. The righteous branch of Isaiah will have a supernatural wisdom from the Spirit, but, but that's not all. He also is going to bring justice to the oppressed. Verse 4 says, With righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The branch from the stump of Jesse is going to bring justice where there was not justice before. When it says he will judge the poor, it, it doesn't mean he's going to bring judgment on the poor here. Uh, that Hebrew verb there, shafat, uh, it could be better translated administer justice for the poor or bring justice to the poor. You know, you, you can certainly see the, the same idea there in the next line when it says decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Uh, the righteous branch is a just judge. He's not blind to the cause of oppressed people. Now I know that today people go, go back and forth all day long uh, arguing about who the oppressed people of the world really are. Uh, but, but the righteous branch doesn't need to argue about who is being oppressed because he, he already knows. He has a, a wisdom from the spirit that transcends human wisdom. And he will judge with the rod of his mouth, according to verse 4. What does that mean, the rod of his mouth? Well, it means that it's the word of God that justly judges mankind. It's the word of God that exposes human sin, and, and it's that sin that's the root of all oppression. Uh, you might remember a picture that, that John gives us of, of Jesus in the book of Revelation. Revelation 1.16. It says that from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. Now that, that doesn't mean that he was physically attacking with some kind of sword from his mouth. It means that the word of God is the thing that cuts deep. That is the thing that, that will judge humankind. And that is what Jesus himself will use to judge the world. The word of God is what the branch is going to use to judge the nations. The branch will bring wisdom from the Spirit, and with that wisdom, he will judge the nations in righteousness. And so what is the result of his judgment? Well, it's going to be a lasting peace, a lasting peace. And we see that in verses 6 through 8. It says, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, 
The calf and the lion and the fattened calf together and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze and their young shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. You may be familiar with this passage already. This, this is the passage where we get the, the, the picture of the lion and the lamb together from. You know, oddly enough, we don't actually see those, those two right next to each other uh, in, in this poetry here, but you, it's the same idea. Um, this is a poetic metaphor describing the depths of, the, of peace that the branch will bring. Predators and prey together with, without, without any violence. You know, the, the, there's, there's four pairs here that it describes, and, and the first three pairs are, are all things that, that might have been seen back in, back in Isaiah's day. Uh, you have a wolf and a lamb, a predator and a prey, a leopard and a goat, a lion and a calf. But when you get to the last pair, there's something different about that last pair. We see at the end of verse 6, it's, it's not just a pair of animals in that last pair. Uh, it says, a little child shall lead them. And then at verse 8, we see that, that final pair again. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand over the adder's den. The last pair is a child and a snake. It's, it's a different picture than, than the other three pairs of animals. These, these two are not laying down together. The child is putting his hand on the, on the adder's den, on the snake's, over the snake's hole. Now, you know, if you were to put your hand down a hole where you know a snake is, probably not going to be a good thing, is it? What, what's going to happen? Something's going to bite your hand, right? You're going to get bit by a snake. But that's not what happens here. The picture here is that there's, there's a child subduing a serpent. It says, the, the little child shall lead them. This child, this righteous branch, will subdue the serpent. And that's going to lead all of creation to a lasting peace. You know, this passage has to take us back to Genesis 3.15. Those of you who, who remember, that's, that's when, when God cursed the serpent. You know, the one who tempted Adam and Eve back in the garden. Uh, he's, God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. When the righteous branch comes, he will subdue the serpent. He will be the one who was bruised in his heel so that the head of the snake would be crushed. And you know who that is. You know who the righteous branch is. You know who this child is that Isaiah is talking about. It's the child who would come on that very first Christmas day. It's Jesus Christ himself. Jesus is our righteous branch. He was that, that shoot from the stump, that, that seemingly dead stump of Jesse. He's the one who will sit on the throne forever, fulfilling that covenant promise to David. He will come again one day to this earth. He will judge the world with perfect justice. He will bring a peace that none can end. And in order to accomplish that, he was willing to come in flesh to us. He took on human flesh. He lived with all of the, the sin, all of the oppression, all of the injustice that the world could bring and put on him. He, he took all of that and he went to the cross to die in your place and mine. His death is what brings us peace. You see, when he put his hand over the hole of the snake, he did take that bite so that everyone else could have peace. Jesus Christ took on your sin and mine so that, so that we could, by faith and repentance, we could trust in him and we could be forgiven and redeemed and made new. I know it's the Christmas season now, uh, but I also know that this Christmas season is different. I know that many in this world, uh, whether, whether it's you or someone else that's not here, uh, many in this world are feeling uh, not much of a sense of, of peace right now, not, not much of a sense of joy. Uh, I know there's many people who are concerned, uh, I, and I also know that many people uh, 
when they, many Christians, when they say they're concerned, you know, it's kind of the uh, acceptable Christian way of saying that I'm worried and afraid. Uh, it, there's no use trying to hide it if you are, uh, because honestly, I am concerned too sometimes. Uh, I'm concerned about how long this virus is going to go on. I'm concerned that more of us may get it. I'm concerned that, that someone that we know or care about may not recover in the same way that, that many already have. Uh, some of you have already had a friend or a family member who has had a serious case. It's hard to think about joy to the world and peace on earth right now for, for so many. Our nation's dealing with a lot of turmoil right now. There's, uh, especially over this last election, there's a lot of concern on every, on every side. Uh, it's hard to think about Christmas right now, this year, 2020. How can we think about peace in a time like this? Well, the only way to do that is to look at the signal. That's our last point, the signal. Uh, it's in verse 10. It says, in, in that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. The root of Jesse will stand as a signal to the people. That word there, signal, that, that literally means a, a, a flag or a banner or, or a sign, something visible that people can look at, and, and it represents something. Uh, it, this verse means that Jesus is the banner. He's the, he's the flag. He's the sign. He's, he's pointing the way. And so when people look, look at Jesus and say, who, who is that? What, what is that pointing me to? And, and Jesus says to them, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He is a sign that points us to, to a right relationship with God himself, with, with the Father. Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. His life is a picture to us of, of not just his own love, but the Father's love for us. So here we are, this Christmas, the only way for us to know that, that justice, that, that hope, that peace, that joy is to look at the sign, is to look at Jesus Christ, the righteous branch. We have to look at him and we have to know he's the only way that we're going to find lasting peace. It's not through any hope of this world. It's not through any, uh, not through any political hope, not through any uh, prosperity from, uh, from money. It's not from, even from peace in our own family. The only lasting peace comes from Jesus himself. He's the one who will bring justice in the world. He's the one, when we walk with him, when we fear him even, we don't have to have a fear of the world because we can, we can walk hand in hand with him knowing that, that we're, when we're in his hands, we don't have to be afraid of anything else. Will you join with me in prayer once again? Father in heaven, we are, we are so thankful that you sent your son to be the righteous branch, the one with, with wisdom, the one who would justly judge the earth, the one, the one who will bring true and lasting peace. Oh, Father, we thank you that, that his kingdom has already been inaugurated now as he came and he died and he rose again. Father, we look forward to his second coming when, when that peace will finally come. And Lord, we pray that now as we live through this world, as we live through the trials of this day, help us, Father, not to be sidetracked to any direction. Help us not to look to some kind of earthly peace, earthly hope, but help us to be fixed on you. Help us to be agents of your love, mercy, grace. Help us to, to be pictures of, of Jesus. Even help us to be ones who would carry that sign so that others can see. We ask all this. In the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. And so now we come to the communion table. Uh, this is a time when we fellowship together over the, the body and the blood of the Lord. Uh, we remember what our Lord told us at that, that last supper with his, with his disciples. Uh, we remember that, that this is a time when, when they came
together just before he died. And he told them as they were eating that Passover meal that this would be a new covenant, a new covenant that he was making with them. And so that's what we celebrate here as we come to the table. Now, this table is for believers in Christ. This table is for all those who have professed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who have come in repentance of their sins and acknowledging him. And so I want to take a moment now, as we come to this table, to, to humble ourselves once again before the Lord. We need to come to the table with, with a right heart. We need to come to the table recognizing not that we are perfect, that we have it all together, but that we are sinners in need of a Savior. We are sinners who need this table. We have to come not from a, a place of pride, not from a place of uh, believing that, that we deserve this in any way, but humbly recognizing that we're desperately in need of this meal from our Lord himself. So, so let's take a moment now and let's, let's silently pray. I want to remind you also, uh, for, for those... If, if this is not your faith, let, let this pass you by. But for, for those who, who are believers, humbly now examine your heart before the Lord. Let's pray. Father, in the quietness of our hearts, when we take the time to listen to your Spirit, we acknowledge that your Spirit points out many things that we wish were not there. And so, Father, we confess these to you. We confess our, our sin. We confess that our sin is, uh, is grotesque to you. We confess that without your intervention, without your help, we would be hopelessly lost and doomed. But Father, we come to this table because you invited us. We come to this table because you have, have brought us in through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's, it's because he was willing to come as the righteous branch. He was willing to come even as a, as a little child to, to put his hand over the hole of the snake's den. He was willing to do that for us so that we could come and be united to you. Oh, Father, we praise you. We thank you. And Lord, now as we partake of this table together, we ask that you would nourish us. Nourish us by your word, by the spirit, by, by the knowledge that Jesus is meeting here with us right now. Thank you for what you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. And so, as they were meeting, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. John.
body of Christ broken for you. Let's eat together. his disciples he then also he took the cup when he had given thanks for it he, he gave it to all of them and he said drink of it all of you this blood this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins Christ's blood given for you let's drink Our Lord, the righteous branch, he came physically. He physically experienced, he physically endured all the hardships this world had to offer. To the point of giving his very own body to be broken. His very own blood to be poured out. And he did that for you, for me, for all who would call on his name. And now we have the great hope that, that he will come again. Jesus will come. And as he said... That very night, that last supper with his disciples, he said, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine again until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And so this, this table holds a promise for us. And the promise is that we will eat and drink with our Lord in his kingdom. Now that's a great hope. That's a great peace and a great joy that we have this Christmas season. So let's... Let's receive the Lord's benediction as we go out into this world with, with peace and joy today. It comes from Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.